Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. I'm Jonathan Salk. I'm CEO of Corfac, and I appreciate you uh, making time out of your day to, to do this. Just, just a little background. Um, the Next Generation Committee um, was very anxious to do something, uh, give a piece of a, of a course and information from the CCIM Institute. And uh, here we are a couple months later after they uh, decided to do that. And I'd like to introduce Mark Pollan, who um, is, Mark, I'm gonna guess you've been probably a CCIM instructor for 30, 35, 40 years. Uh, 32 years now. Yep. I, I've known Mark for a long time. For those of you who don't know, I spent a good part of my career at CCIM. And um, it's it's always been a pleasure working with Mark. And I am not saying this just because he's here. He, he truly has always been one of the better or best CCIM instructors out there. So um, without further ado, uh, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. And just a couple of housekeeping thing, guy, guys. Um, Mark prefers if you have questions, just ask them uh, as opposed to putting them in the chat room. And um, uh, and please, if you haven't done it already, mute yourselves and uh, we will kick it off. Thanks, Mark. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Well, welcome everyone. Um, nice to see you all. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm looking at some some of you that do have your video on, and um, I guess both Andrew and Robert Freeling, maybe. Um, you guys don't seem like next gen to me, but I'm absolutely delighted to have you with us. Um, it's uh, old guys like you guys and me, or I think uh, next gen or not, you know, where the wisdom resides. And so, uh, whether we know a lot or not, at least we know how to get through the day. So that's a good sign. Um, this session is, um, is part of the uh, uh, CCIM Institute's Ward Center for Education. And um, the Ward Center is a piece of the CCIM Institute uh, that delivers short form online um, important information uh, as opposed to our uh, CCIM designation track. And so within this, we have, a, uh, we have a bunch of classes that are all about the development and construction. Uh, we have uh, uh, things ranging from uh, communication skills to cost segregation, uh, all running anywhere between an hour and a half and four hours split over a couple of days. So uh, really worth looking at uh, in terms of trying to garner some important current information on something you might be doing. And then the other track is, of course, the CCIM designation track, uh, which is a, a series of um, uh, four-day live courses or you know, various methodologies of delivering those courses online uh, that lead to being able to wear a CCIM pin somewhere down the line. Uh, those courses cover the, the lifestyle of a real estate investment, so they, they start, we start by talking about, um, should I buy something and at what price? And then we, we go to um, the digital world and we look at uh, demographics and psychographics and Bureau of Labor Statistics stuff to determine where opportunities lie in any given marketplace. Uh, then we take a look at the real estate cycle uh, of business uh, from the owner's point of view. So we look at leases and lessees and ownership and then the last course that we teach in the core course section is, um, uh, is the flip side of the first one, not should I buy it, but is it time to dispose of it? And if so, how should I do that? Um, we have a couple of other courses. We have a negotiations course. It's part of the CCIM curriculum pro uh, program, uh, all required to get to the point where you take a, uh, a comprehensive exam. And then um, finally, after that, you get to wear a pin. So uh, it's, a, it's a long journey, but uh, one that um, uh, I found uh, incredibly valuable to me in terms of um, becoming a profitable per person uh, in the um, commercial real estate world. So, um, so as Jonathan said, and I, you know, I've been around for a long time. Um, uh, I, I, I've, I've been in the corporate world, I've been a broker, I've been a consultant, I've been all, you know, just about everything you can imagine. 
Um, the one thing, the one thing that I have never done is I've never been in a deal uh, that was valued at more than twenty-five million dollars. Um, so um, I've not done a lot of REIT or private equity deals, but I've always worked in secondary and tertiary markets, and so it's the under twenty-five million dollar market that I've been typically involved with, and. Um, uh, turned out to be pretty lucrative all in all. So I live in, um, I live just south of Hartford, Connecticut in a little town called Middle Haddam, which is where they used to build clipper ships uh, back in the 1800s. So uh, it's an interesting place to live. Um, and uh, from there today, uh, I do only teaching and consulting with uh, not old age-wise clients, but clients that I've had for a long time. All right, so um, somewhere in your materials section, uh, I the Corfac has uploaded for you some uh, good course materials for you to use. Um, there's the CCIM financial calculator. There's a, uh, a really great uh, spreadsheet called DCF analysis that allows you to uh, input data on a property and uh, assumptions, and it fills out all of the pro forma work for you. And I've also uploaded three of our primary business forms uh, that help you track by hand the uh, uh, projections for a piece of real estate. The reason that I included these is because they all, I've used them all as part of the process of delivering the information in this class. So the class content. Um, I'm gonna talk about what to do to create a cap rate if you don't have a decent comparable sales or survey data with which to do that. I'm also going to talk about choosing discount rates and building them uh, with economic data, again, as opposed to survey data. And the reason for that is because we just went through a pandemic and historical data then ceases to have the same importance and impact as it would have uh, otherwise. Uh, we're also going to take a longer term look at the economic impact uh, of COVID-19 on a sample property. And uh, uh, we're going to look and see what the impact is of uh, COVID-related vacancies on the uh, yield of those assets. So uh, a lot to do uh, and, and important to do because um, from the, the, you know, the, the top of the ladder to the bottom, everybody's trying to figure out what's going on, what to expect in the future, uh, what, is, what are the final impacts of, of, of a pandemic, what relationship will that have to the uh, to my ability to make money, my clients' abilities to make money, and what's going to happen to the properties that they already own, and what impact might that have on properties that they might want to buy in the future. Uh, and so one of the key issues that will always come up, and you'll see later on when I start um, laying out these methodologies, uh, you'll note that uh, inflation is, is the big I don't know right now. Um, and so I brought some charts and, and, and what I'll be showing you as we go through this is that even though survey data uh, may not be as useful as it once was, it still can help frame the area that you're working in. Uh, and so uh, one of the biggest issues we're facing right now is nobody really knows what's going to happen with inflation. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of concern back in May when uh, uh, the the annual jump jumped to almost five percent for inflation. Um, but you know, you have to remember that whenever you're looking at annual numbers, um, you have to remember to look back and see what was going on at the beginning of that time period. Uh, I have a friend who's just getting into uh, investing in equities. And he said he was looking at all these uh, uh, funds that he might buy, and he realized that they were all the highest they've ever been in a year. And I said, well, just remember that a year ago, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so, you know, anything you're looking at over a year is really going to be um, tainted in terms of, you know, other things. So maybe you want to take a, a longer term look if you're still going to use survey data and summary data. So. Uh, just remember that short-term information today is, uh, is short-term historical data today is going to be highly questionable. Um, MBA, the uh, Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, puts this out on a quarterly basis. Uh, they, they track and then predict things like consumer price indexes. So again, back on the inflation track. Uh, they also do the 10-year treasury. And another really important piece for those of us in commercial real estate 
And you know the the things to to recognize here is that uh, um, you know MBA. I mean, they're granted they're selling home ownership, so you know you've always got to be careful of the source of the material that you're looking at. Uh, but they're talking about a fairly consistent, uh, um, you know, uh, CPI uh, over the next couple of years. And, 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 you know, I was surprised to see that. But then when I looked back and realized that the changes between 2020 and 2021 have not been as drastic as I thought they would be, uh, it's interesting to, to keep all of this in mind uh, and, and to understand what's going on in the world around us. Uh, where they have really uh, um, uh, gotten to a point that surprised me in, in this piece is uh, down here where they're talking about the 10-year treasury. Now, granted, the 10-year treasury has been crazy low for a long time, but they're really predicting a, a pretty stiff uh, uh, jump uh, over the next couple of years. And the relationship between 10-year treasuries and the cost to borrow funds to buy real estate is a direct one. And so uh, understanding that if the cost to borrow funds goes up, uh, you know, from 3% to 6%, uh, it's going to have a serious impact on the value of that real estate. So, so remembering and thinking about the, you know, the economic impacts uh, of the future becomes really, really important. If you had any question at all about whether or not the world is coming back, uh, all you have to do is go to the TSA pre-check travel a website and see how many people are suddenly traveling again. And uh, um, it has, it took some serious jumps in the last uh, uh, last month or so, uh, but you can see during the pandemic, you know, 600,000 on June 21st, um, currently over 2 million and it was only 2 million seven pre-pandemic. And so uh, clearly uh, people are back out on the road again. They're, they're living a life as they once were. And so uh, what we can expect, I believe, is a lot more normalcy and a lot less uh, uh, difficulty as we move through. This class has five premises. Um, and the first one is this one, is that if you work in a robust market, um, then you have typically ample access to cap rates, discount rates, sale prices per square foot, everything you would want to figure out what something is worth. Uh, the problem is that if you're not in a robust market or if you work in secondary or tertiary markets or with properties in the less than two and a half million dollar category on a regular basis, you don't have nearly as much decent survey data to use to determine any of these items. Premise two, uh, coming out of a pandemic, uh, historical data may no longer be as valid as it once was. So we have to be really, really careful if we look at survey data and benchmark data in making decisions. Uh, we have to recognize in premise three that what is really more important than anything today is the asset type and the asset location. Uh, and I mean very specifically the trade area uh, and the asset type. Those are really going to key into what a property is actually going to be worth. Um, and so when I talk about this, you know, what I'm suggesting is uh, there was a time uh, in, a, in, a, in a robust market where national data was just as good as city data and trade area data. Uh, no longer the case. Today, I think you have to work the other direction. You have to start in your trade area and then back up into the, to the other survey data to see if the other survey data supports what you're finding in your own particular marketplace. So that's where the emphasis needs to be. Uh, premise four, and this is a premise that uh, both I and the CCIM Institute believe in pretty fervently, and that's future performance impacts present value. And uh, lastly, uh, there's no such thing as a real estate with a single value, even though appraisers will give you a single value and lenders will come up with a single value for an asset to, to loan you money. Um, anytime you're predicting value, you have to recognize that what you're doing is providing somebody with a possible range in values of which your number is probably the most likely number, but certainly doesn't represent all the possibilities. Uh, and the way to, I think, best exemplify that is to look at the difference between investment value and market value. And so if you take a, a, a graph like this, where you have the, the vertical, the, the, the price on the left, and the horizontal bar being history to the present, 
and you do what is classic, which is comparable sales to determine current value. And you say, okay, so here were these uh, eight different sales. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically do as an appraiser uh, or as a broker, I'm gonna do a weighted average. I'm gonna say, okay, all of these, uh, you know, I'll adjust them here and there. And, and between them all, I will come up with a market value. And that is great. And that is a wonderful way to do it. Uh, if everything has been going in the exact same direction for the amount of time you're, you were looking at it, and it plans on doing the same thing moving forward. The problem is when things like pandemics occur, um, all of these uh, prior sales become less important and they put a big question mark on the market value of the asset that you're looking at, which means that looking back may not be the best possible way to figure out what your asset is worth, but looking forward might very well be the best answer to that question. And so back to the specific asset type and specific geography, you know, as you, th there's a lot of regional data that's available to us. Uh, IRR.com, uh, if you don't use it, I would highly recommend it. That stands for Integra Realty Resources. Uh, it's a compendium of appraisers that collect a bunch of data every year and then submit annual reports and, uh, and then special reports. But they track regional things like cap rates and discount rates and, uh, and, and rental rates and things like that. But the thing to remember is, you know, there was a day when I could look at, uh, uh, you know, the Eastern region, and I'm going to use some of that information in today's class. But um, today I have to recognize that in any of these regions, there are drastically, drastically different municipalities and trade areas. And that looking at you know, the Western region information uh, probably isn't gonna give me a lot of good information about what's going on in Bakersfield because it's gonna be so heavily weighted by what's going on in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Portland. And so you have to remember when you're looking at this kind of regional data that you may be uh, missing out on what's actually going on uh, in your own marketplace. Uh, the general pandemic impact, most people have looked at this now and have said, okay, so here's what happened. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, retail, depending on whether you were bricks and mortar or, or online, uh, went both directions. Uh, it had a huge impact on warehouse and distribution world uh, during the, uh, the pandemic. And so uh, the value of, of uh, most distribution centers went up. Uh, the value of most bricks and mortar retail went down. Uh, the value of all hospitality dropped. Uh, office got hit pretty, pretty seriously. Uh, and uh, uh, multifamily, depending on the kind of multifamily that you were working on during the pandemic, uh, it did well or did not do well. Student housing, nursing homes took serious hits. Uh, standard suburban multifamily. Uh, did very, very well because people tried to get out of where they lived in terms of urban areas uh, out into more suburban areas where they felt safer. So, so there was a lot of play inside. And um, <clears throat> this comes from uh, CoStar and Real Capital Analytics, this information. And so, uh, in, and, and remember, again, uh, CoStar information is all plus two and a half million dollar properties. So if the property was under that number, it's not in any of this data. Um, but as you can see, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the uh, cap rates went down for industrial, um, vacancies went down, rent went up. Uh, for multifamily, uh, there was a pretty drastic drop, uh, as you can see, uh, in, uh, in effective rent uh, with vacancies going up. And while all that was going on, surprisingly enough, cap rates continued to go down for multifamily properties. Uh, while that was going on, uh, in retail, again, you can see in the top chart, uh, vacancy rates pretty much skyrocketed, rent went down. Uh, and yet again, uh, surprisingly enough, in the over two and a half million dollar market, um, retail uh, cap rates uh, tended to go down, prices tended to go up. And then again, in the office product, uh, that's where you see probably the largest jump in vacancy, the largest drop uh, in rent, and uh, a, a leveling out of 
um, of cap rates. And so, so the interesting thing to me with all of this information is uh, even though uh, we suffered through a pandemic, um, the general trend of cap rates was to stay fairly, uh, fairly even. And that meant that the investors who are out there looking at income producing real estate were not feeling as much of the risk issue uh, as many of us thought they would. Uh, there are some places that track uh, um, uh, cap rate margins or spreads between cap rates and the 10 year treasury. Uh, and you can see here in 21, that was uh, 460 basis points. Um, it was uh, substantially worse uh, um, back here in the 2010, 2011. Uh, it was only a little bit better, uh, you know, in, in the height of uh, everybody feeling really good pre-pandemic. And so um, watching this spread gives me some idea of um, uh, how investors are feeling uh, about the risk involved in buying uh, income producing properties of any kind. Uh, also, it's probably important to track real estate cycles. Uh, Dr. Miller out of the uh, uh, University of Denver uh, and the uh, uh, Burn School uh, of Business provides mm -hmm. CCIM Institute with uh, market cycle information every quarter. Uh, he uses a bell curve. Uh, he, this is um, uh, position one, here and position one here are the same place, only 10 to 12 years apart, typically. Uh, this is the good part, obviously, of a real estate cycle, and these represent opportunity uh, in the downside. And so I want to show you some of the things he delivers because it's, it's kind of interesting just to, to look at that. Um, the, the illustration on the left is uh, fourth quarter 2020. The illustration on the right is second quarter 2021. And uh, what he does is in this case, he charts out the average uh, national property type. Uh, so, you know, office industrial warehouse and things like that and tracks how they move along. And, and one of the things that's uh, noticeable here is that uh, there's been very little movement uh, in terms of uh, uh, where particular products are located along the real estate cycle. But if you start taking a look at the real estate cycle by breaking it down into the 50 municipalities that he tracks um, from that same time period, fourth quarter 2020 to second quarter 2021, uh, you do begin to see a movement um, uh, from, from the expansion phase uh, into the hyper supply phase. The hyper supply phase is the phase where you have a lot of product but beginning to have diminishing demand. And that is the beginning of the recession phase. Uh, and so you can see a lot of municipalities have moved uh, in a very short period of time, a half a year, uh, from expansion to hyper supply. And that is true in the office market. Um, the uh, industrial market uh, stayed pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, again, uh, and the reason for that, obviously, is that uh, 2020 was a good year for the industrial market. So there was very little movement. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, moving down the real estate cycle. Uh, if you take a look at apartments, uh, again, uh, they suffered a little bit. There is a continuing trend in apartments uh, for the uh, uh, production to be high, but the demand to be slowing up a little bit in many places. And that's pushing a lot of these uh, product types uh, into the recession area. The recession area is, is the point where rents start to drop a little bit. Uh, and there's still a fair amount of supply out there. Uh, and then in the retail market, uh, we see a, a pretty substantial uh, movement from the expansion phase pre-pandemic uh, down, uh, further down to the uh, hyper supply and recession phase. And so, so recognizing in general these moves uh, is kind of important. Um, if you are lucky enough to be one of the municipalities that Dr. Miller covers, uh, I would highly recommend, you know, checking out his stuff because it's it's pretty good. And and I am lucky because he does include Hartford uh, in his work. And so if I'm doing any work for clients in the Hartford area, I can I can access some of this information that is more specific to our trade area uh, than it would be if I was looking at general national information. Uh, I mentioned um, uh, Integra Realty Resources, IRR.com. Uh, they put out an annual, a free annual report every year. All you need to do is register and they don't bother you uh, after that. 
but they track cap rates and discount rates, uh, and they track uh, the delta uh, between the previous year and the year that they publish. So their 2021 viewpoint uh, really represents information that they gathered in 2020. Uh, and so uh, as one might expect, uh, all cap rates uh, went up in 2020, uh, regardless of the region or the national averages. So there was an increase pretty much across the board uh, in the office products. Uh, for, uh, uh, for multifamily, it was mixed. And for retail, uh, all cap rates went up. There was a strong delta difference between 2020, 2019 and 2020. Uh, and um, in industrial, as you also might expect, uh, we saw the same trend. We saw industrial did very well in 2020. And so uh, as their uh, rental rates went up and demand for that product went up, uh, their cap rates uh, went down based on how they were in 2019. And then uh, finally, um, there's uh, uh, this nice little chart that, that kind of breaks the world up into um, the, uh, um, the realtor market, which is basically the uh, um, uh, under two and a half million dollar properties, uh, the uh, RCA market, real capital analytics, the over two and a half million dollar market, and then Green Street, which is representative of the REIT marketplace. Uh, and you can see that uh, um, year over year changes in commercial property prices. Uh, you can see the drops in 2020, and then you can see then the beginning of the increase in valuation as we move into 2021. And so, so all of this would suggest to me, right, because remember, um, future performance uh, is the predictor for current value. And all of these charts would suggest that future performance should be pretty good. So predicting performance is all about understanding where things are going. And uh, um, you know Wayne Gretzky, uh, the, the famous guy who said that he always skated to where the puck was going to be, not where it's been. And so uh, what I wanna do is work with you a little bit in terms of this market specificity and geography and product type and, and talk about um, if I'm not going to use historical data to get to the number, what will I use? Well, I think what I'm going to use is I'm going to either use some real-time data, uh, and that's what I'm going to do when I show you the band of investment methodology for building cap rates, and then I'm going to use some future or forward-looking analytics to talk about discount rates and how one might select them to determine the current value of a real estate asset depending on its uh, future performance. So, um, the acquisition cap rate is going to be about what's it worth today, and the discount rate is going to be what is it going to do in the future and how will that impact what it's worth today. So uh, um, I'm going to use uh, back and forth in and out uh, this 25 unit suburban multifamily uh, property uh, as my uh, uh, sample property as we walk through this, and this particular multifamily property uh, is somewhere between class A and class B. And I'll, I'll show you some of that uh, figures as we go through. So let's start with uh, cap rates, uh, national averages. Uh, so this is IRR.com. If they took, um, you know, the, all over the country and they looked at all of the uh, uh, cap rates uh, for urban and suburban, class A and class B uh, apartments, and they came up with uh, four different uh, averages uh, from 538 to 626 being the highest with an average of 5.82% being a cap rate uh, that they found as a national average. And if you were to take the uh, uh, cap rates from Real Capital Analytics for apartments, and they are, remember they over two and a half million dollars, uh, they're at cap rates of about 4.9%. So that's about uh, you know, 100 basis points different from the national average. And then if you were to take uh, the NAR information, uh, you would see that the uh, uh, Class A and B uh, multifamily product, uh, again, uh, somewhere uh, slightly above the national average, which would include the, um, uh, the real capital analytics properties, uh, but, you know, again, slightly edging higher than the national average for apartments. And so I, I look at this because um, I, I understand that if I'm in San Francisco, uh, 
that I can't pay any attention to these numbers. But I do understand that if I'm in any other secondary or tertiary market in the country, I can play these against what I find out going on in my marketplace and see if there's similarity between them, right? So, so this survey data still plays an important role, uh, just not specific enough for me to use that by itself. Uh, again, I've got to remember that it's my trade area that's important. Those numbers might very well be true in Bakersfield, but they're clearly not going to be true in San Francisco. So the, the method that I want to show you for building a capitalization rate is called the band of investment methodology. And this has been used for many, 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 many years. Uh, and it, uh, it uses uh, current data, so absolutely current market data, uh, to come up with a relevant valuation for an asset. And the formula uh, is based on the fact that almost everybody borrows money to buy real estate. And so if you can determine the required cash returns for the parties in the deal, so one party is the lender, one party is the equity side, if you can figure out what each of they, those participants require as, as a return, you can build a cap rate and then you can apply it based on what percentage of the deal each of them is going to control or have part of. And so here's the formula for band of investment methodology. Uh, it's the percent of the deal that, that equity represents times their required cash on cash return. Uh, and that gets me a number. And then the percent of the deal that's represented by the debt uh, times the mortgage constant. And I will talk to you about what all of these things are in a second. That gets me another number. And Band of Investment says, if I know uh, equity's position and I know the debt's position, then I can build a cap rate uh, by uh, uh, working through this formula uh, for Band of Investment. And so, uh, the investor's required cash return is called cash on cash. Uh, the lender's required cash return is called the mortgage constant. And uh, uh, once I have that, right, I calculate the weighted averages of all of these things, and that gets me to a cap rate. So cash on cash, uh, that's the actual cash in and the actual cash out in a deal. Uh, so it's a nice hard money comparison. And so if you were to look at one of the forms that I supplied to you, which is the uh, uh, cash flow analysis worksheet, uh, you would see that the cash on cash return is the relationship between uh, down here, line 22, cash flow before taxes. So how much money did you finally get out of the deal uh, uh, versus how much money did you put into the deal? Uh, purchase price plus acquisition costs. So compare the two, see what that return is. And it, it's kind of a, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard money deal. So it, it's like, okay, if I just put that much cash in a bank today, what return would I get from it? So that's the comparison point uh, for cash on cash returns. Uh, so you might be thinking uh, a savings account or, or an E-Trade savings account that might pay you as much as 2%, uh, plus some kind of a, of a risk premium for the fact that you have uh, a non-guaranteed return. Uh, that's how most, uh, um, most investors will get to their, uh, their choice of a uh, uh, required cash on cash return. So I get that and then I figure out, well, what's the mortgage constant? Well, the mortgage constant is totally dependent on the terms of the mortgage. Uh, and so uh, for me to do that, I have to look at the specific mortgages being offered and I have to build from there. Um, so the mortgage constant itself is the annual debt service. That's why it depends on the terms of the mortgage uh, divided by the amount of the mortgage that is given. So uh, the mortgage amount being based on the loans of the term and the reason why band of investment methodology is such a good way to do it is that it has to do with actual lenders that are actually in the market that are willing to loan on a particular property. And so in this case, uh, I will be able to take this formula and work it out both for equity uh, and debt and build that cap rate based on the two banks that uh, would be available to loan money on this particular asset uh, at the moment, right? So this is real-time data. So I've got one bank uh, that says we'll do 70% loan to value uh, at 5.5%. 
And I have another bank that says, well, um, you know, we're not, um, we're a little cautious in terms of how many dollars we want to put in the deal. Uh, but uh, at a 60% loan to value, we can give you this loan at 4%, both of them on a 25 year amortization schedule. So, um, so I've got to figure out, okay, so I've got these two banks, uh, what is their, uh, um, you know, what, what am I going to get for their mortgage constant so I can get that in there so I can build my cap rate. And so what I do, and, and I've done this on the CCIM financial calculator, which, I, which has been included in your course materials, uh, I have laid out the loans 25 years with monthly payments. So that's 300 payments. Uh, one of them from bank one is at five and a half percent. I used $100,000 for the amount of the loan. I could use any number I want and I'll show you how that works because the mortgage constant is really based on the terms of the loan. So the years and the interest rate and the time uh, as opposed to anything else. And so uh, if I go through this and I solve for payment on my financial calculator, it tells me that in this $100,000 loan, the payment would be $615, $14. And so $614 payment times 12 payments means my annual debt service would be a little under $7,400. And then that $7,400 in annual debt service divided by the $100,000 loan amount would give me a 7.37% uh, mortgage constant. Now, as I said, I could use any number. So just as an example, if I use this same mortgage, only I changed this 100 to 200,000 and went through the same procedure, I would come up with the same mortgage constant. So now I have a, a payments of 1228, <laughs> annual debt service of a little under 15,000, uh, divide that by the $200,000 loan amount and voila, uh, there I am back at my 7.37% mortgage constant. So it doesn't matter what number you put into PD, what matters is what you put into the terms of the loan. Uh, okay, so there's bank one. I figured out that their mortgage constant is 7.37%. Uh, then I go to bank two, uh, very different kind of mortgage, way lower, uh, uh, way lower interest rate, even though they'd be putting less money into the deal. Uh, I then figure out what the payment is on their loan, uh, figure out what the annual debt service is on the loan, divide that by the loan amount, and that gets me a 6.33% mortgage constant for bank two. And so then I take that information, and that's the information that I can put into the mortgage constant piece of the formula. So uh, here's the formula played out for bank one. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the, the equity side requires a 5% return on their 25% of the deal. Uh, the lender requires a 7.37% return on their 75% of the deal. So there's the cash on cash and the mortgage constant. 25% times 5%, 75% times 7.37 uh, brings me these numbers. Uh, finally, what I have now built is a cap rate based on the terms of the mortgage and the requirements of the investors of 6.78%. And then I do the same thing for bank two. <clears throat> when I put all those numbers together, 40% uh, of the deal needs a 5% return, 60% of the deal needs a 6.33% return, uh, add up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the results of that, and I end up with a cap rate uh, of 5.8% uh, based on uh, building this cap rate based on the investors and the banks that will actually be involved in the transaction. And so what I end up with is a derived cap rate of 6.78% for bank one and a derived cap rate of 5.8% uh, for bank two. So, um, you know, a couple of things that that tells me right away, A, if the lender is going to value the property based on, on, on this derived cap rate, I'm going to bank one, no doubt. Uh, because bank one is going to have a particularly uh, higher uh, uh, opinion of value of the asset, uh, a lower opinion of value of the asset than will bank two. And so if I look then at the cap rates that I derive from the current market, and then I go back and I pay attention to the survey data, what I find, which is not surprising to me, is that the cap rates that I determined um, uh, you know, are, are not, the, uh, uh, not the cap rate from real capital analytics, but do more represent the range in values that I would have seen on uh, um, the less than two and a half million dollars 
or the national averages. So I can feel fairly comfortable about that. Uh, I can feel pretty comfortable that um, given the time that I created this, that it's not particularly unlikely that they might be slightly higher uh, than the averages in the country. But at least I've done it very specifically in my marketplace with a very specific product type. So uh, I get a couple of, uh, a couple of different results. Uh, this property uh, uh, from one bank's point of view uh, would be worth $5,300,000 for a loan. The other one, maybe $6 million for a loan. Uh, what the actual purchase price would be, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it will end up now falling somewhere between these couple of numbers, right? So that's one way I can do it. Uh, if I don't have, if I want to augment, if you will, the survey data uh, that I've been able to collect uh, it from other places. And then let's take now our, our next move and let's not think so much about today and yesterday, but let's think about tomorrow. And let's take a look at the other process, which is the discounted cash flow analysis process. And in this process, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, track uh, the uh, performance of the property over time. So I'm going to do a five-year pro forma of the asset. Uh, and I'm going to have to figure out uh, how many dollars I'm going to put in the deal, uh, how many dollars I'm going to get out as rent, and how many dollars I'm going to get for the property when I sell it. This T-bar that I'm showing you is a CCIM copyrighted process for uh, collecting and looking at data uh, when you do pro formas on real estate. So it's, uh, uh, it's a really nice thing. Uh, all our financial calculators are based on this way of organizing the material. So uh, one of the things I have to think about, though, if I'm thinking into the future is, OK, so what is the future going to look like? And uh, for quite a while, people have been talking about the various kinds of uh, real estate cycles we can expect to see as we move into the future. Uh, one of them is V. Uh, will it look like this? People have been talking about uh, up and down and up and down, or down and up and up, down and up. Uh, people are talking about a, a trough, a, kind of a long time in the trough before we start up again. Uh, and other people have said, no, this is the end of the world. Uh, we're in the trough forever. Um, and so uh, what, what my feeling is and what all the survey data I've been able to, to accumulate suggests that the most likely is the most common. It's going, to be a, uh, um, it's going to be a real estate cycle that's going to look like most real estate cycles before uh, we fell into the trough and then we will slowly come out of that trough uh, and we will head uh, north for the entire time. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I can do now is now that I'm working on discount rates, one of the places I can go to is I can, I can go back to IRR.com and I can see, well, what's the difference between, you know, uh, their 2020 report and their 2021 report if I want to track discount rates of survey data. And what I find is it's a little bit mixed, but it's pretty consistently not very different. Uh, one region to another, one property type to another. Uh, it seems like uh, it's pretty darn consistent uh, throughout 2019 information collected in the two 2020 report and the 2020 information in the 2021 report. So uh, consistency is a good thing in real estate. And so I look at this and I go, okay, this is pretty good. Uh, I can figure that the devastation is probably over and uh, uh, anything we see uh, moving forward should be great. Now, not so true if I happen to live in, uh, um, you know, uh, or, or own property in Manhattan and it's all office property and it's all class B uh, because I'm hurting pretty bad if that's the case. If I owned class A property, um, you know, even though the property was vacant, uh, the owners were still paying rent. And so I did okay anyway, right? So this is where you start to segment the world into uh, the haves and the haves nots, if you will, in terms of the durability of income streams. Here's the formula. Uh, this is the, the buildup formula for discount rates. And this is uh, um, uh, used consistently by appraisers around the world uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, represent a discount rate using um, uh, current and future looking uh, uh, data, right? So, um, so it says, listen, if you, if you take the real risk-free rate, that would be the 10-year treasury, uh, and you add to that expected inflation, and you add to that this risk premium, the spread between 10-year treasuries and cap rates, 
that you can use to build a discount rate. And so 10-year um, treasury, uh, CPI or inflation, uh, spread between cap rates and 10-year treasuries. If I can gather all three of those, I can build a discount rate. So uh, for me, in terms of working with my customers and clients, uh, it's really, really important that I, I help them understand, as I said early on, there's no single value for a real estate asset. And so what I try to do is I try to show them the three scenarios that are, they're likely to see, uh, a best case scenario, worst case scenario, and, and the one I think is most likely to happen. So uh, I've got to track the treasury, right? And on 622, uh, the 10-year treasury was 1.49%, uh, 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 almost 1.5%. Um, uh, by 10-year treasury standards, crazy low. Uh, as you can see by... Uh, looking at a 50-year uh, um, history, and that red bar represents uh, about a 1.6% treasury rate. So you can see uh, the treasury notes have rarely been as low as they are today or for really the last decade. And that's, of course, as, as you all know, because the Fed basically said, we're not going to let it free float. We're going to control this number. And so if you look at the 10-year uh, treasury over a 10-year history, you can also see that, you know, except for that pretty serious drop in 2020, uh, most of the time, uh, the treasury in that 10-year period has been over 2%, not under 2%. But even, but right now, it's right around 1.5%. So, you know, part of what I have to think about when I'm, when I'm thinking about these things is, how long will this go on for? Where can I expect things to be? What's the best way for me to estimate future performance? Uh, for inflation, well, I have the same kinds of issues. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the chart on the left, that tracks about a 50 years, uh, uh, make that uh, 60 years worth of, uh, uh, of inflation. And you can see that it, you know, it tends to uh, pretty much be around the same, same number, around 2%. Uh, but there were times where inflation was uh, pretty high. Uh, and uh, uh, those were interesting times for those of us that were in the business then. Uh, if we look at the current or the 10-year the spread right now, uh, we can see where the drop occurred in uh, 2020 and where the beginning of going back up again in 2021. Uh, and this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this uh, represents um, you know, what we're experiencing now. And remember, this is month by month, and May was the month that everybody freaked out because inflation was 5% uh, compared to uh, where it was uh, in May of the previous year. And so, um, you know, this relationship scared everybody, but it's not going to hold, which is what everybody firmly believes. Um, and also recognize that, uh, you know, right around a 2%, uh, 2 to 3%. Uh, number seems to really track uh, the middle ground for, um, for inflation, CPI. And then lastly, the last piece is this risk premium, the spread between cap rates and 10-year treasuries. And uh, um, in this case, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, tracking from Real Capital Analytics, uh, the spread. The spread represents the uh, uh, investors' Uh, feeling about the risk involved in, in, in purchasing something. Uh, the cap rates on the right represent the national averages for cap rates. And so if I were to take the class A properties uh, and fit them into this mold for a risk premium, I would see the current mm -hmm. treasury at 1.6. Uh, I would see the current cap rate uh, based on class A suburban at 5.6. And so that would tell me that the spread would be four percentage points, 4%, four, uh, 400 basis points, 4% spread. If I took the class B information, treasury at 1.6, current cap rate at 6.26, uh, that would show me a spread of 4.66%. So a higher spread is going to mean, uh, in the long run, it's going to mean a higher discount rate. Uh, <clears throat> and so if I move from this information, uh, and I start with uh, uh, the current, current numbers, absolutely current numbers, current treasury, current cap rate, current spread. Uh, I can now build uh, my discount rate. So the treasury at 1.6, uh, expected inflation at 3, 
uh, risk premium at four, uh, add them all up, I end up with a discount rate based on current numbers of 8.6%. But I'm also gonna say, you know, that 8.6% representing current numbers um, represents current numbers. And sometimes things change. And me being a, a fairly conservative guy, I tend to think, you know, what I really wanna look at is 25, is, is 10 year averages. Because uh, over a 10 year period, and that's what I told my investor friend who was just getting into equities, I said, see what the property has done over, asset has done over 10 years. Because uh, that way you can absorb most of the ups and downs and, and it'll tell you what, you know, what you can generally expect. So if I do this same piece, only I build it now based on 10 year averages, uh, I get something that looks like this. Uh, the 10 year treasury average is 253. The expected inflation uh, averages out at 1.9. Uh, the spread has an average spread uh, of uh, treasury to cap rates of five. So that gives me a discount rate of 9.44%. So now I have current numbers telling me I should use an 8.6 discount rate, 10 year averages telling me I should use a 9.5 discount rate. And then I go, well, what about what's going to happen in the future? Maybe I should look at that as well. So I make some guesstimates about the future. And I say, you know, what if there's less inflation and greater risk? What if there's more inflation and less risk? And so uh, one of those yields a discount rate of 10. One of those yields a discount rate of nine and a half. So I look at all of my scenarios, best case, worst case, most likely scenario. And this is what I end up with. I have this spread of, of a low of 8.6 and a high of 10 uh, for a potential discount rate. And the discount rate is the number that I apply to all the future cash flows of the property uh, to figure out what I should pay for it today. Uh, basically it says, uh, I want a 10% return or I want an 8.6% return or I want a 9.4% return. And so uh, choosing that discount rates lets me uh, assume some risk and help me understand uh, the lowest possible price versus the highest possible price given these discount rates. So uh, what should I pay for the property if I want an 8.6 rate return? What should I pay if I can take a, if I need a 9.4% return? What can I pay if I need a 10% return over my holding period? And so I put the information about the property into a T-bar. Um, so I include what I pay for it. Well, I'm gonna actually solve for that. Uh, the cash flows after tax, uh, or before tax and then the sale proceeds. So this is this unit, right? 25 rooms, 25 units, uh, 360,000 in NOI, that operating income. These are my three discount rates that I'm going to use to look at the asset. I'm going to uh, assume that the asset will increase at the rate, the, the NOI will increase at the rate of 2% per year. So if I use a 5.6% cap rate, uh, based on the first year's NOI, that tells me that I would be able to pay $6,428,000 for the property. I would sell it at the end of five years for this much. That's the same cap rate going out as I used going in. Solve for the internal rate of return. And that says, okay, so if I buy in and out at a 5.6 cap, and these are the, these are the cash flows, um, my internal rate of return will be a little over 7.5%. And then I say, okay, so what if I do a 6.26 cap rate uh, in and out, you're right, that was based on the class B apartments. Uh, how, what will that internal rate of return look like for me? So now I've used 626, which brings a slightly lower purchase price, slightly uh, lower sales price at the end of the holding period. That gives me an internal rate of return of 8.26%. Uh, so here are the two combined uh, using either the class B price or the uh, uh, class A price. Uh, I have them next to each other now. And I say, okay, so that's good. So now let me take those numbers based on the 5.6 cap rate, the class A building. And now let me apply my discount rates. So I do a net present value calculation. And I say, you know what? I want to first look at this property based on an 8.6 discount rate. So I determine that if I need 8.6, uh, I can only pay uh, $5,671,000 for the property because I have to pay uh, almost $80,000 less if I want a higher rate of return. And then I look at it based on a 9.44% discount rate, which I had previously figured. 
uh, everything else the same. And that tells me that uh, I can only pay, uh, you know, uh, a little under five million five hundred thousand dollars for the property. And then I'll look at it the third time, and now using my ten percent discount rate, and that tells me, well, I can only pay this uh, five million three fifty thousand. And so I take those and I line them all up in a little table, and I say, all right. So um, using the three different discount rates it's suggesting three different values. And then I do a weighted average. I say, okay, so those are the three, those represent the range. What's the likelihood of each of these occurring, right? And so I say, well, you know, in my opinion, uh, using the current numbers, there's a 25% chance that would occur. Uh, using 10-year averages, I think that's a 50% chance that would occur. And using the highest discount rate, I think, again, there's a 25% chance that would occur. So I do a weighted average. I figure all that out, and that tells me that the most likely single value for this asset that is bracketed by these values is that this property is worth about five and a half million dollars. Okay, so that's another way to go about doing it. Uh, and that is by uh, you know building these discount rates, applying them to the income stream of the property, and then doing weighted averages on what's what returns. Now, I want to look at one more thing before we finish, uh, and that's the long-term view yield impact. Uh, what I was really surprised at here was that the, um, the assets uh, were not as severely impacted in terms of yield as I thought they might be. And so uh, I first I said, OK, so pre-pandemic, uh, this asset was going to have a 3% vacancy rate throughout, uh, and it would have had a 10.67% return, internal rate of return. Um, if I took uh, the next problem area and I said, well, during the pandemic, I would have 20% vacancy followed by a 10% vacancy uh, followed by a 3% vacancy thereafter. So it would, it would get better after, um, you know, after a couple of years, uh, that would drop me from a 10.67 to a 10.32% return for the property. Not a terrible hit. And then I said, you know, down here, what if it was pretty bad. Uh, what if I had a 40% drop? So what if I had student housing and I had nobody in my asset uh, for a year? And then it took me another year to get it back up to place. And then it needed to stabilize and then 3% thereafter. Uh, that would drop me from 1067 to 968. And then there was the, well, what if I have an office building and it's just never going to come back fully? Uh, and so I have a 40% vacancy, then 30, then 20, and then it levels out at 10 as opposed to three. Uh, what is that going to look like? And that ends up showing me that my internal rate of return on that asset would be about 8%. And so uh, I can look at these, uh, you know, graphically like this, or then I can lay them out like this. And I can say, okay, so I've got, here's my pre-COVID return on this asset. Uh, here is the best case scenario where it comes back really quickly. Uh, here's the most likely scenario where it takes a little less time, a little more time for that to happen. And here's the worst case scenario uh, where if things just never quite come back to the way they were before. And then I can do another weighted average on this, right? I can say, you know, there's a 50% chance in my mind that the, the most likely scenario will occur. Uh, there's a 25% likelihood that the best case and the worst case scenarios will occur. And so if I do a weighted average on those, uh, it tells me that I'm looking at about a 9.42% yield on this asset. And so if I take this asset and I lay it out and I say, okay, so the pre-COVID pro forma yield was 10.67, the most likely yield based on all of my work is 9.42%. So um, probably not enough to keep anybody out of the market and probably enough looking forward to assure someone that the worst is over and they'll do okay, even though they had to deal with that fairly serious bump uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the pandemic. And that is one hour's worth of information. I know it came pretty rapidly. I assume this is being videoed and you'll get a chance to go back and look at any of this stuff again if there's something else you wanna know. Uh, also, um, Please feel free to, to email me for any additional commentary you might have or any follow up that you uh, that you'd like to do. I'm more than happy and you'll find that I'm really good at uh, returning emails.
Um, so uh, that's me. Uh, that's creating reliable valuations. And uh, that's the hour. So I guess uh, turn it back to you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Mark, very much. Um, great information. And as Mark indicated, we will send information out to all those who are on the call with uh, the recording and the slides and all that. And so you have them accessible. But unless someone has any questions for Mark, um, we'll, we'll call it a session. Any, any questions? Excellent. All right. Wowed them to sleep, did I? Everybody stuck around, Mark. <laughs> Everybody stuck around. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. Yeah. All right, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you.